Welcome to the seventh video in this series covering the fundamentals of screenwriting and storytelling. If you'd like to watch the rest of the videos, you can find them linked in the description or on the end screen of this video. Now that we have an understanding of how exposition works in narrative, let's look specifically at screenwriting and identify the different good and bad ways exposition can be added to a story written for the screen. I'll be looking at specific techniques that can be used to add exposition to a screenplay, as well as bad techniques that should be avoided. Let's begin. One of the most common ways for a character to tell another character information in a film is direct telling. One character simply gives another character important information for the story. Go, 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 go. Seven years per hour here. Let's make it count. This technique is used constantly in films, and like many forms of exposition, it can be used correctly and used terribly. Remember that exposition works best when it attacks the characters and changes their situation. The example I gave in the previous video from the beginning of Aliens is a great example of direct telling exposition used correctly. Another great example of direct telling exposition comes in this scene from Arrival. Help me understand. Colonel Weber doesn't understand Luis's methods for communicating with the aliens, so Luis explains it to him. This is a large chunk of exposition, and it's extremely important for the story. What makes this scene work is that Colonel Weber and the audience are attacked with exposition. When Luis explains what she must do, we understand how difficult of a problem she's dealing with and how hard it will be to communicate with the aliens. Another important note, Luis's entire explanation lasts only one minute. There's no wasted time, which means the film doesn't have to completely pause for this exposition to be given to the audience. Now let's take a look at a bad example. In this scene from Big Hero 6, Hero is talking to his older brother, Tadashi, and they give us this piece of exposition. Unbelievable. Oh, what would mom and dad say? I don't know. They're, they're gone. They died when I was three, remember? This is a terrible way to give exposition. See how it sounds so forced when he says it? Why? A couple reasons. One, both of these characters know this information. Of course Tadashi remembers when his parents died. People never tell each other important information they both already know. And two, this does not attack with exposition. This doesn't change anything for these two characters. It doesn't change their world and it doesn't change the stakes of the story because they already both know this information. Therefore, it needs to be cut from the story or delivered in a way that actually attacks with exposition. When you have to deliver exposition through one character telling another character information, find how you can attack with exposition. How does the information change the character's situation? How does it change their world? What actions are they forced to take because of what they've learned? The next way of incorporating exposition is the flashback. Flashbacks are when we jump back in time briefly to learn new information about the current story. First off, I'll say that flashbacks are used incorrectly by amateur and professional writers all the time. If you're writing a flashback into your short script right now, probably stop and think about how you can tell the story in a different way. While there are tons of examples of flashbacks used well, they're used excessively by bad writers. Here's a massive rule from Story by Robert McKee. Do not bring in a flashback until you have created the need and desire to know. The flashback must be motivated and necessary to the current story. Many writers cut to flashbacks and the audience doesn't have any understanding for why the flashback is necessary, so they get bored. The audience must need the flashback. Whether or not they're expecting it to happen, the audience should know that a flashback will fill in important information for where the story is going in the future. A fantastic example of the flashback used correctly is in Wind River. Now these are major spoilers for Wind River, but this is also one of the best flashbacks I've seen in recent films, and it's absolutely worth examining. This flashback comes at the major turning point into Act 3 of the film. For the entire film, Jane and Corey are trying to find Natalie's murderer. The audience does not know what happened on the night of her murder, and it's information we are constantly seeking as the story unfolds. Then as Jane goes to a nearby oil drilling site to find more information about Natalie's death, we get a flashback to the night of Natalie's murder. This scene finally gives us crucial information right before a dramatic showdown. We finally know who killed Natalie and what happened that caused her death. When we enter this flashback, the audience already has a desire to know the information that they are going to be given in this flashback. Then, this flashback attacks with exposition. 
Not only do we learn who killed Natalie, we know that the men Jane is with right now are those killers, which means Jane is in grave danger. This flashback satisfied the audience's desire to know crucial information, and it attacked the main character with this information, setting up a moment of extreme tension when we finally cut back to the present day. Jane, get away from the door! Now let's take a look at a flashback done poorly. In Suicide Squad, Harley Quinn stares into a vat of acid and we get a flashback to her and Joker early in their relationship. This flashback doesn't actually move the story or provide any information. We know Harley Quinn and the Joker are together. This just shows us a moment between them. It doesn't attack with information because we don't learn anything and it does not affect the characters in the present. It does not attack with exposition, there was no desire to know this exposition, it's simply a useless flashback. We even get multiple different flashbacks of Joker and Harley Quinn's relationship throughout the film. Earlier in the film, we get a full exposition dump of how Harley Quinn fell in love with the Joker, which means there's even less reason for this flashback. It's simply wasted screen time. The audience needs a desire to know the information you're giving in a flashback. If the audience doesn't care when we enter the flashback, it will slow the momentum of the story. Even in a flashback, attack with exposition. What we learn in the flashback should affect our understanding of the present and affect the characters. Now let's take a look at montages. Some montages are great, but most of the time, montages are used simply to show the passage of time without any real conflict or drama. While not necessarily bad, they generally become exposition dumps and should be avoided. Especially in short scripts, avoid montages. Find better ways to show the passing of time or to give the exposition necessary. And many times they could simply be cut altogether. We can all think of great montages like the Rocky training montage, but that's the exception and not the rule. In Captain America the First Avenger, we get a montage of Captain America and his team fighting Hydra and gaining ground against them. All the montage does is tell us that Captain America is winning. There's no stakes, and there's not much emotion. It's simply showing us the passage of time, and unfortunately, a part of the story the audience may actually have wanted to see in depth. This montage does not attack with exposition, and so it simply slows down the momentum of the story. Now one of the greatest montages of all time comes near the end of The Godfather, where the new Don Michael Corleone orders hits on all of his enemies while at the baptism of his godson. This montage doesn't just show us the passing of time or show us some fun scenes intercutted together. This montage is the culmination of Michael's arc in the film. This montage shows the biggest move of power Michael makes in the entire film. We are attacked with exposition because Michael's hit on the other mob bosses creates a new level of his power and solidifies him as the leader of the Corleone family. It creates the final major turning point in the story. And now let's look at dream sequences. Dream sequences are almost all terrible. I'll also include vision sequences, mind games, or essentially any sequence that is purely mental and doesn't matter to the story. For every good dream sequence you can show me, I can show you a hundred terrible ones. Avoid dream sequences at all costs. Here's a couple bad examples. In Apollo 13, one of the astronauts has a dream about the mission going wrong. Then he wakes up. Nothing has changed. And we know, because this is a historical event, that the Apollo 13 mission did go wrong. It's a useless moment for the story. In Man of Steel, we have a vision sequence where Zod simply lays out his villainous plan point by point. While this does attack with exposition because Earth is now in danger, it's the laziest way to get across this information. It's this long sequence full of interesting imagery in hopes that we don't notice that Zod is giving us paragraphs full of exposition. Even worse, nowadays these visions or dream sequences are used as marketing ploys and not actual elements of the story. The best examples of this are Avengers Age of Ultron, Star Wars The Force Awakens, and Batman v Superman. Now let's look at a couple good examples and why they work. First, people talk a lot about Inception, but what happens in Inception is not a dream sequence. The characters can die in real life if they are killed in the dream, and the reason they are in the dream will affect the real world. So there are stakes and cost when they are in the dream, which means it isn't a dream sequence. It's just part of the science fiction world of the story. If you bring real world consequences into a dream, it ceases to be a dream sequence and simply becomes an interesting sci-fi mechanic. In Avengers Age of Ultron, Tony Stark's visions of the future directly affect his actions. 
His dreams are why he builds Ultron. This is the acceptable way to write a vision or dream sequence because his real life is being dramatically changed by his dream. But make sure not to overdo this. And the other Avengers visions in the same film really don't matter. They just show us information that's kind of cool and interesting in the moment, but doesn't change anything in the story. So it ends up being lazy and useless while Tony Stark's vision has weight for the narrative. The biggest problem with a dream sequence is the lack of stakes. If there are stakes, it's no longer a dream sequence and just part of the action of the story. Dream sequences are defined by their lack of stakes and trying to hide exposition with dreamlike imagery and sounds rather than following exposition fundamentals like show don't tell and attack with exposition. A lot of different films struggle with forced exposition, especially in the setup. This is where the audience is being told rather than shown a particular piece of exposition. This is sometimes necessary and unavoidable, but it should be avoided as much as possible. For example, in The Social Network, early in the film, we get Harvard University, Fall 2003. While this is forced exposition that isn't motivated by any sort of conflict, there's nothing wrong with this. It's quick, necessary, and helps the audience understand the setting. However, this can go too far. In the opening sequence of A Quiet Place, we get the most important story information. There are killer monsters in the world who are attracted to sound. Then later on, we get this really unnecessary exposition in the form of newspaper clippings and a whiteboard with different facts about the monsters written on it. Many films have used this camera moves over newspaper clipping style of giving exposition, and it's always forced and rarely necessary. It's a clunky thing we've gotten used to in films that you should try to avoid in your own writing. One of the most iconic forced exposition templates is the Star Wars opening crawl found in the beginning of each Star Wars episode. While it's adored by many Star Wars fans, the crawl is fundamentally just a couple minutes of straight exposition to get the audience up to speed. Now obviously science fiction films like A Quiet Place and Star Wars have to give more exposition than a film like The Social Network. And these moments of exposition don't make those films bad. The point is to do your best to find better ways to add exposition to your story. Exposition in the setting and setup, especially in science fiction or fantasy stories, will be difficult to convey without being a bit bulky. It's also much better to do what these films do and give this exposition in the beginning of the film rather than waiting until the conflict and momentum of the story has already built. Avoid long chunks of exposition. Whether that's hovering across newspapers, listening to news anchors explain things, or watching yellow words move through space. But if your story absolutely must have this, do it in the beginning to set up the world. Avoid this as much as possible when your story is moving. But what if you have to get through big chunks of exposition in the middle of your story? How do you maintain audience interest? One way to give out a lot of exposition is to simply be stylish. You can have some cool guy in a suit give it to you, or you can use a beautiful woman, and, like I said before, if you make your exposition unique enough, it can become iconic. While these stylish turns can help hide exposition dumps, they should continue to follow the core narrative idea, which is to attack with exposition. And, as much as possible, show don't tell. In the big short, Jared Vennett pitches to the front point partners and explains the housing bubble. While it's stylish and fun, using Jenga pieces to explain the idea, it also creates a major story turn for the characters. This revelation is the inciting incident for the front point partner's story. Also in the big short, the story must explain to the audience what a collateralized debt obligation is. Rather than simply explain it to us, the story uses Richard Thaler and Selena Gomez betting at a poker table to show us the concept. It's the direct telling of a boring topic, which sucks, but it still moves the conflict of the story. This scene does two things. It attacks with exposition because it shows just how big the housing market bubble is and what happens if it fails, and two, it takes this complicated concept and shows us using an analogy. Then we get to see people in the casino feel the effects of the bet made at the poker table, which gives us an analogy to what will happen in the economy. Now it's still not ideal, but the filmmakers do everything they can to give this information in the right way and at the right time in the story. I recommend studying The Big Short when wanting to learn about exposition, because the film deals with boring, complicated financial topics and finds a way to explain them to the audience without losing steam in the narrative. Making exposition flashy or stylized can help, but it still needs to be built on core narrative mechanics. Attack with exposition, show don't tell. 
If you are able to attack with exposition, it will be much easier to get through these big chunks of information. There are different ways to add exposition to the medium of film, but they should always continue to follow the core fundamentals of what makes exposition work in a story. Whether you're getting one character to tell another character information, using a flashback, or starting a montage, your exposition should continue to show rather than tell, attack with exposition, and give the right exposition at the right time. Now that you have an understanding of some of the fundamentals of screenwriting, let's take a look at dialogue, how it works in a story, and how you should practically think about it for your screenplay. So be sure to check out the other videos in this series by clicking the playlist now. And if you like this video, leave a like and subscribe for more videos just like this one.